Uh, there's a number of people uh, now in the in the room, so welcome everybody to the uh, to the webinar by Richard about conflict in practice. And you, um, hi Richard, uh, you uh, reformulated the title a little bit, so um, to take away any confusion, the title of the presentation now is reformulating the issue. So Richard, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, there we go. So, about reformulating the issue, incorporating, let me make this screen a bit smaller, there we go. Uh, reformulating the issue, incorporating the different stakeholders' views. Yes, welcome everyone to the HIVOS Social Innovation Award 2014, the webinar on um, conflict in practice or reformulating the issue, incorporating the different stakeholders' views. My name is Richard Gerritsen. I work for the University of Amsterdam at the Amsterdam Center for Conflict Studies where I teach and design courses around social innovation, um, social entrepreneurship, conflict and negotiation, mediation, what is conflict, but also how to use art as a form of intervention in, um, in conflict, moments of conflict, conflict between different stakeholders. And that also brings me to um, what conflict might mean, um, because there's two things that I need to say about conflict. First of all, we do not perceive conflict as something that is negative. Conflict means that there is a desire for change and that people simply disagree on how to bring that change about. And the second thing that I need to say about conflict is that it is not necessarily violent. So a disagreement between different stakeholders, which is something we're going to talk about today, doesn't have to be violent um, and can still be very messy. Um, and I should say something about what is in the right-hand corner, which is Creative Interventions Amsterdam, which is um, an organization or collective that I co-founded um, and this is where we deal with social issues by bringing together uh, creative thinkers, so these are architects, uh, designers and artists, and researchers from different fields um, in order to bring the best of both, both worlds, the creative thinkers bringing about uh, change that is more sexy and the researchers bringing about change that is more researched. So, through a lot of reflection, we try and make sure that we get the best of both worlds. So today I'm going to walk you through a, if it works, hang on. Today I'm going to walk you through, there we go, a case study around a social innovator, which is a partner of ours, and who was dealing with a problem of conflict. And this is a, um, an organization who knows what their values is, so their why was well established, which was sustainability, locality, connectedness, and participatory design. And they knew what they wanted because they, uh, and how they wanted it, participatory design. But what this project was about, they weren't quite clear on, um, even though they were well embedded in a community, so they were able to already, as Sarah mentioned yesterday, um, reframe the issue according to the end user, the public being the end user. And so they knew they had to do something around an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood. Uh, this is our starting point today. So the business model was already rather clear for the organization. Uh, they had quite a network and they had already gone to the end user and tried out a variety of options. For instance, they had done stuff around fences because fences were considered part of the problem of an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood, but they found out that working with fences was very difficult. Um, so they had to abandon that idea. They had prototyped it, it didn't work. Something you might have been familiar with um, now. So this is the issue, unsafe feeling in the neighborhood. And the residents, they, um, they, for them, an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood meant that there was a problem around there being few lights, uh, tall buildings, and few evening activities. And when you think about an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood, one of the other stakeholders that easily comes to mind is 
the police. So the police were saying, yeah, well, an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood, that's because there's high criminality in this neighborhood. Another stakeholder that came to mind was housing corporations, because in Amsterdam there's a lot of housing corporations, they rent out houses, and um, if the real estate value goes up, then they are able to sell some of these rented houses, and then they can build new houses and rent them out again. That's their business model, pretty much. And when we talked about an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood with them, uh, they said, well, yeah, the problem for us is real estate damage, unemployment, unpaid rent, little maintenance. The local council, um, someone who is also involved uh, when it comes to unsafe feeling in the neighborhood, a quite obvious choice of the stakeholder that is obviously involved. And they said, well, the problem is actually around low social capital, few active citizens, little social cohesion. These are the problems that we're dealing with when we're talking about unsafe feeling in the neighborhood. So having um, said that, you start thinking, okay, so there's a problem around skills, there's a problem around social capital, so maybe we should go and talk to job agencies and find out what they have to say. And they say, well, the problem is that there's few jobs available, there's little skills development, and there's a lot of informal work practices, like drug dealers. So still, um, with few skills available and jobs apparently not being available, at least you can educate the people so that you know we can get out of this dire situation that uh, the people seem to be in. But the schools said, well, actually we have a problem with general low level of education and language barriers. See, actually what you need, according to the schools, is 70% children of highly educated families and then if you have 30% of children coming from low educated families, the 70% can lift up the 30% without doing any damage for the 70%. But we are nowhere near 70% children coming from highly educated parents, so that's a huge problem. Plus, we have a lot of immigrants in this neighborhood, and they all speak different languages, so they can't even communicate with each other, and we can even not, not communicate with some of these parents. So these are the problems according to the school when you start talking about an unsafe feeling in the neighborhood. So if you bring them all together, these are your stakeholders and you're trying to come in as a social innovator and you might even be perceived as another stakeholder. And it doesn't really look like this in practice when you look at how all the different stakeholders perceive the problem. It actually looks more like this as in every stakeholder is looking in a different direction and has a different idea of which issue needs to be dealt with first in order to deal with the unsafe feeling in the neighborhood. It very often isn't even about the unsafe feeling in the neighborhood for them. So if you look at this picture, then yeah, it becomes a problem. Just imagine that you start dealing with this problem and this is your picture, these people are likely to get into a conflict. Imagine you would put them in a room together, which might actually be a good thing. I mean, these groups are never really put in a room together, if only they were. But imagine that they were put in a room together and there was nobody to facilitate the, the practice and there was nobody to mediate or, or give them a, a guideline for how to negotiate with each other. They would probably all disagree on what the first topic should be for them to deal with. So let's step back for a minute, let's zoom out and try and figure out what it is that these stakeholders really care about. And for that we're going to be looking at their interest, which is very often what informs their position. We're going to be looking at their needs, which is what sustains the stakeholder, what um, keeps them going and might even have them expand, and at their values. What is their why? Why do they actually exist? What is their core value that has brought them into life. And if you look at these three elements, it becomes more clear what the different stakeholders actually care about. And you're able to broaden their perspective and hence, as we'll see, the available options. So let's go through the residents. Their interests, values, and needs. What they care about is family, occupation. They care about getting food on the table. They care about connections with each other. They care about recognition, generally recognition of their issues. So if you put that together in a way that they might look at problems they're facing, you could say that they need their environment to relate to their needs more. For the police, 
um, interests, values, needs, order, control, safety, authority, respect, might not always be what they say they need, but then if you see them in practice, you can figure out that mm, without authority, they can't do much, and respect is something that they value a lot. So bringing that together, what is then the perspective of the police in the broadest sense, which is that they need to know what's going on in the neighborhood. For the housing corporations, of course they care about renters. They need the real estate value to stay or go up. They need good housing conditions and they need new development in order to sustain themselves. And thus, if you bring that all together, their broad perception could be that the neighborhood needs to become more attractive. That's good for the housing corporations. The local council then, they need to be building trust. Public opinion is important. Some of them might like to get re-elected. An effective policy and tackle highlighted issues, issues that have come up in the media or that are clearly present in the street. And if you bring that together, then making policy addressing feelings of unsafety is, is pretty broad view of the local council regarding the issue. Um, job agencies then, caring about available jobs, skilled applicants, employing people, and a sustainable amount of clientele. Bringing that together, their broad perception could be connecting people with jobs that improve their skills. And last, the schools that care about school attendancy, high performance rates, because then they go up in the statistics, diverse mix of educational background, safe learning environment. So bringing that together, their broad perception of what they, what they could do, what they care about is building an attractive environment for learning. And then if you bring the six together, it becomes a completely different picture. You can, you can even remove the unsafe feeling in the neighborhood is something that connects them and put up something that broadens the available options um, by not only reframing the concerns of these stakeholders, as you've just seen, but by reframing the room for possible options. So we have here the need to get a clearer picture of what is going on in the neighborhood as to use our skills to meet the needs in the neighborhood. So we need to get a clearer picture of what is going on in the neighborhood to use our skills to meet the needs in the neighborhood. And that incorporates all of the needs of those different parties. So then if you go talk to the parties and ask for their involvement, it becomes far more easy to get them involved and you're far less likely to get into conflict because this is a way of reformulating the issue that allows them all to put something in. So a number of questions might arise based on your reformulated issue. So this brings us back to Sarah who says, what are the questions, right, that you are asking? What are the questions that you need an answer for in order to have a successful prototype and to, in order to figure out whether your prototype is successful? So a number of questions, if we look at the previous slide, we need to get a clearer picture of what's going on in the neighborhood as to use our skills to meet the needs in the neighborhood. Then questions that obviously arise are, what are the needs in the neighborhood? What is going on in the neighborhood? Which skills are useful for meeting those needs and who exactly has those skills? Many of these questions you can probably answer already to a certain extent. For instance, uh, the case that I was speaking about um, performed by our partner, Vic Lecture, um, in this case, they already knew what the needs in the neighborhood were. This was clear to them because they were embedded within the community. So not only did they care about the fences, but as you saw, they, they had issues around lighting. And lighting is then something that they picked up. They decided that designing public lighting in a participatory process would actually meet a great deal of the needs of the different stakeholders because Let's go back to the stakeholders. If we are designing um, public lighting according to the needs of the, the people, then of course the, the residents are happy. It relates their environment to their needs. For the police, it's a very tangible thing, right? Suddenly there's lighting of dark corners, so they can know what is going on in the neighborhood a little bit more. Um, they might even be able to help and point out to you 
which are problematic dark corners for the police. The neighborhood might become more attractive because people are more involved in the neighborhood and then generally people start caring more about the neighborhood. Um, a policy of addressing feelings of unsafety is dealt with by dealing with this issue that the residents themselves brought up, namely the issue of lighting. Connecting people with jobs that improve their skills, well, at least the skills of people are improved because those who participate in the process of designing this public lighting become more familiar with how exactly do you get something out in the public space. Um, they get more familiar with um, electricity and how to design a lamp. But also in this case, they decided that the lamps had to be sustainable, so they informed themselves around solar power. Um, so that, that way the residents improved their skills. And all of these stakeholders in one way or another were able to get involved, which makes it really a social innovative practice. Lastly, um, for the schools, building an attractive environment for learning, interestingly enough, through this participatory process, um, a learning environment was created that attracted children and eventually children started their own project in this learning environment. So, and because it was around lighting, um, the Gletscher even managed to get another stakeholder on board being an energy company that was interested in this issue. So also think about which other stakeholders might you be able to get on board once you know what to do. Just to briefly summarize, you have the original issue, you figure out who the stakeholders are, you find out what their needs, values and interests are, and that way you can broaden the way in which they're looking at the issue. Incorporating all these views, you might even be able to reformulate the issue to broaden your options for change. Lastly, keep in mind, check with the stakeholders whether you got it right. So the more you involve the stakeholders in the process, the more likely you are to get their support and hence be successful and avoid conflictual situations. Second, find answers to your questions. There's questions that obviously arise and see how to find an answer to that. Sarah's lecture, have another look at it. It might be able to help you there. And don't be afraid to alter your original idea based on the findings. The example of the fence in this case is a good one. They started with the fence, they started prototyping and figured out actually this doesn't work. But in the process they found out a lot about the stakeholders and what they really care about. And then they could move on to the lamping and try that out. Good luck and I'm available for questions. Thanks so much Richard for your, uh, for your interesting talk. Um, 